Street Management, and welcome you all here tonight. I am the hearing officer. I didn't know what I was called, but I, I guess I have to make sure everybody stays in line and stuff. But, you know, um, tonight's meeting, I'm going to put my glasses on and read this. Uh, I'm also um, a proxy for Commissioner Bowman on ASMFC. I sit on most of the committee, most of the boards there as well. So that's my involvement. I'm not, uh, Alan Boland's involved with the council with us here. The scoping hearing is on summer flounder, scup, black sea bass, commercial and recreational allocation amendment, which is being developed by the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. This is a joint action uh, by both the council and the commission, um, given that summer flounder, scup, and black sea bass are cooperative management uh, by the two um, groups across state and federal waters. Dustin Colson leaning from the ASMFC, in the background information on this action and the possible types of management approaches that we may be considering. Uh, you'll be invited to ask questions first, and then, uh, then you can provide comments. This meeting will be recorded. Uh, we are live on YouTube right now, so watch your language, unless you want it on there for posterity, but it's on, it's on YouTube right now. Uh, we, we broadcast all of our meetings on YouTube, and we usually have them up there. People can watch them afterwards as well. Um, it'll be part of, uh, that, that will all be part of the official record. Each person will, can provide comments. Everybody has a chance to speak and give their comments that they have. Uh, when asking, when you ask a question, please state your full name so we can get that down and any affiliation you may have. And um, uh, with that, I will turn it over to Dustin and we can start the presentation. And if there's any, any questions before we start, the rest of us will write out there if anybody needs one. And we have a bluefish meeting in here immediately afterwards. So want to stay for that you can but it's uh we've got that scheduled for six so hopefully we can get out of here by then thanks all right thanks pat like pat said my name is dustin colson leaning and i am the oh yeah sounds like we're mic'd up good to go <laughs> i am the summer flounder scup fishery management plan coordinator for the atlantic states marine fisheries commission And like Pat said, I'll be presenting on the uh, commercial recreational allocation amendment today. I'll start with a little bit of background uh, on the amendment process, um, go over the scoping process, which we're currently in, um, and then talk about examples of types of management alternatives that may be considered in this amendment, followed by next steps. Um, after that, I'll take questions and comments, and like Pat mentioned, uh, if you could hold questions and comments until after the presentation, uh, that'll make sure we can get through it and leave enough time to take down your comments at the end. So summer flounder scup and black sea bass are cooperatively managed by the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, also known as the Council in Federal Waters, and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, also known as the Commission in State Waters. Um, as such, the, the amendment is a joint action, um, and it will be modifying the Complementary Fishery Management Plans, or FMPs, for both groups. The sco scoping process is also a joint effort, so any and all uh, comments will be reviewed and received by both groups. So the purpose of this action is to consider potential modifications to the allocations of catch or landings between the recreational and commercial sectors for summer flounder scup and black sea bass. So we're currently in the scoping process. Um, it's the first step uh, for amendment development after the amendment has been initiated. Um, scoping is an early and open process for gathering input on the scope of issues to be addressed in an action. Um, and it helps inform the development of a reasonable range of management alternatives to be considered for further analysis. Um, it's the first formal opportunity for all of you to provide your input. Um, and so for those reasons, uh, your input at this stage is very valuable to us. So why was this action in initiated? Um, for all three species, the total allowable catch or landings is allocated between the commercial and recreational sectors based on percentages as defined in the fishery management plans. Uh, the percentages are based on historical proportions of catch and landings between both sectors, and the years used to define each relevant historical period varies by species, as I'll go over in uh, the next few slides. 
Uh, these allocations were established in the early to mid 1990s um, and have not been revised since that time. The main reason this action was initiated is that our understanding of the commercial and recreational harvest estimates during past and recent timeframes have shifted quite significantly since these allocations were established, including revisions to recreational and commercial data, which I'll explain in the next few slides. So in terms of recreational data, the Marine Recreational Information Program, uh, known as MRIP, provides recreational catch and harvest estimates uh, from 1981, when it started, uh, to present day. And in recent years, MRIF made major changes to the methodology used to generate those estimates of recreational effort and catch, uh, which I will describe in more detail on the next slide. So based on these revised methods, in July 2018, uh, MRIP revised its entire time series dating back to 1981 for all species. Uh, the revised estimates of catch and landings for summer flounder, scup, and black sea bass are on average much higher uh, than the previous estimates, especially when you look at more recent timeframes. Under MREP, there is an effort estimation component, uh, which is the number of trips taken. And then there's also the uh, catch rate estimation component, so how many fish caught per angler trip. Um, when you bring these two components together, um, they each come from two different surveys. You're able to generate the combined total estimate of um, catch. And to summarize the recent changes, we can go into this in more detail later, but basically uh, the effort survey experienced the greatest amount of change when it switched from a, a landline survey to a mail-based survey. Um, historically, um, they found that landlines were underestimating recreational effort. You've got people maybe not answering their landlines as frequently anymore with caller ID, or you've got just landlines going out of fashion. So switching to the mail-based survey was found to be more statistically robust. Um, the catch rates are also estimated by shoreside angler interviews, um, and this program has also undergone major revisions um, and a redesign to make their results more statistically robust. And together, those revised methods resulted in overall changes to the total estimates of catch. In addition, you also have um, changes to the commercial data, such as uh, the discard estimates for SCUP were revised. Um, so these also factor into their catch-based allocation. So the changes in recreational and commercial data have management implications for these, for these fisheries. Uh, the historic and recent proportions of recreational and commercial catch and landings under the new data do not match the proportions used to set the allocations in the first place. The allocation percentages are fixed in the fishery management plans, and you can't just update the percentages based on new data. Um, you need to have uh, an amendment. That's why we're here today. This is important because our management programs require us to constrain harvests to the respective limits, and these limits are based on the allocations that are set in the fishery management plans. We do this by using measures such as uh, bag limit, um, seasonal limits, gear restrictions um, to constrain that recreational effort. And now that our understanding of the fisheries does not match the allocations used to set the limits, it's harder to constrain the fisheries to their respective limits. So if you look here, we've got just an overline table that kind of lays out one approach that we could possibly take. Um, basically, you've got the current allocations based on the old data on the left-hand side in blue, and then you've got um, the revised data looking at the allocations in green. So if you start with summer flounder and you look at the base years 1980 through 1989, those were the base years used to set the allocations for commercial and recreational. Um, when, you, when you use that base year, you see that there's a 60% allocation to the commercial total allowable landings and a 40% um, allocation to the recreational total allowable landings. Now, if you just took those same base years, 19 through 1989, and you plugged in the new data, you know, updated MRIP data, 
um, new commercial data, you'd see a different picture. You'd see 55% of the allocation now going to the commercial fishery and 45% going to the recreational fishery. Um, if you did that same thing for SCUP, one line down, using the base years 1988 through 1992, the total allowable catch, which includes discards, is allocated to the commercial fishery and 22% is allocated to the recreational fishery. Again, that's using the old understanding of data. And if you plugged in the new understanding of data, you'd see a change. 65% commercial and 35% uh, recreational. And then lastly, when you look at black sea bass on the bottom, their base years were 1983 to 1992. And the percentages are 49% commercial and 51% recreational. If again, using that new data, the split would be a little bit different. It would look like 45% commercial and 55% recreational. And this just goes to show how if we use the same methodology that was in the original plan, but use the, the new data or updated understanding of data, you'd see a shift in the allocations that could potentially represent the fishery more accurately. So this slide shows uh, commercial and recreational landings and dead discards for summer flounder from 1989 to 2018. Um, based, this data is based on the most recent stock assessment, and this is meant just to provide any context for specific changes to the allocations that you may suggest. Um, the recreational data is shown in blue and the commercial data is shown in orange. Then if you look at this graph, uh, this slide shows commercial and recreational landings and uh, dead discards from 1988 through 2018 for SCUP. Um, this again is used on the most recent stock assessment information. And you can see since Amendment 8, uh, around the time when the stock was being rebuilt, um, both commercial and recreational data have really seen an uptick as the biomass of the stock has really improved. This slide shows uh, commercial and recreational landings and dead discards from 1989 again to 2018, and again using the most recent data. And you can see in the most recent years, the recreational landings and dead discards, uh, which is in blue, has really taken off. Um, and you see that the commercial uh, landings and discards has stayed fairly constant throughout the time period. So the next slide will show um, potential management options that may be considered uh, by you all. It's definitely not a limiting list. It's not an exhaustive list. So any ideas that you have that you came here today to tell us about, it's fair game. But we're just going to show you a few things that um, have been considered before in other management um, plans or just things that have been discussed. Um, please you know, solicit any ideas here. This is just used to, to provide kind of a brainstorm a starting point. Um, priority alternatives for further development will be identified after the board and council uh, review uh, public comments and um, the scoping period is over and then we'll come back to you with a more honed uh, in on list later. So the one option we always have in amendments is no action status quo. Um, that's if we feel that nothing should be changed, things just will remain the way they are and that's always on the table. Um, we can also update the current base years uh, with new data. That kind of goes back to the table I was showing you earlier um, and you can see the potential changes there. Uh, and then you can also change the, the base years. Um, you, looking at the graph that I showed earlier on a few slides, as well as the graphs that are in the uh, public information document that you have, that may you know, help you form a reference on, on what base years you might want to consider. Um, we may not use base years as all, at all if, if the public feels like we should look at socioeconomic considerations, such as optimizing economic efficiency or considering other socioeconomic benefits that's on the table. Um, we're also considering catch versus landings based allocation. Um, I can talk about that more if there's any questions, but basically summer flounder um, and black sea bass are landings uh, based and uh, scup is catch based. Um, we're also considering recreational se sector separation. 
um, basically splitting out the four hire fleet from the other recreational guys. That's, if that's of interest to you, you can voice that today. Um, we're also considering improvements to recreational catch accounting and accountability. Uh, for example, in terms of how to prevent overages of catch and landings uh, limits and uh, what are the responses when overages do occur. Another thing you may consider is whether allocation should be static or dynamic and how should we go about changing them. And lastly, we're considering the ability to allow some of the allocation to be transferred from one sector to another, or it could go both ways um, if one sector is projected to underachieve its, its quota or its recreational harvest limit. Um, you also may consider setting aside uh, some allocation to uh, buffer for unforeseen circumstances. So again, this is just a list of ideas um, that we've come up with and put forward to you, but it's definitely not limiting. Any and all ideas are, are fair game today. So these are some suggested uh, points to focus on when providing comments. Um, are the existing sector allocations appropriate uh, for managing summer flounder, scup, and black sea bass? And if not, how should they be revised? Um, are there fishery trends that managers should consider, as well as um, should the council and commission consider anything else regarding this issue? You have multiple options uh, for how to submit comments. Um, you can give comments today. Uh, you can also write in comments, or you can do both. Uh, we have 11 scheduled scoping hearings, one of which is webinar. Um, and you can find all the information about the scoping hearings in the, the document that you all have. Uh, you can submit written comments by mail, fax, uh, email, or online. Um, the instructions are listed here if you want to take a photo, or I can keep this up for a little bit if you need to. Um, the deadline for written comments is March um, Tuesday, uh, March 17th at 11.59 p.m. And this is just the general outline of, of next steps so you get an idea of the process. Um, scoping is the first step that we're in right now, and uh, we'll, the Council and Commission will review scoping comments at their next joint meeting in May. Um, these options will be flushed out a little bit more at the June meeting. Um, and then May through July, more specific draft management alternatives will be developed. Uh, the Council and Commission are expected to meet again at their joint meeting in August, and then approve a public hearing document at the joint meeting in December. Uh, public hearings would then be held again in early 2021, and uh, that would be the next major phase of, of public input on the process. And then final action of this amendment um, is planned for the spring of 2021. So the rulemaking process would follow that, and so the earliest that any changes would occur would be uh, 2022. So next we'll open it up to questions first. Uh, please provide clarifying questions before diving into comments. Um, I like to be able to answer all of those, uh, but when it's time for public comments, I'll be taking notes myself. So. Um, questions please first and when speaking up please provide your name for the record as well as uh, the name of the organization that you are a spokesperson for so we can jot that down and um, make sure we're being very accurate about where these comments are coming from and with that I'll uh, turn it over for questions go ahead Greg Greg the Domenico of Gordon State Seafood Association uh, if you could please go back to how you describe your new understanding of the commercial scup fishery. Can you explain that again? Which you slide? Um, earlier in, the, in, the, in your presentation, it said you have a new understanding of some of the commercial fisheries, or at least one of the commercial fisheries, scup mm -hmm. being one of them. What's the new understanding? Yeah, so for the dead discard estimates, the estimation methodology uh, had been updated, I think, for the 2015 benchmark assessment. Um, and so that influenced some of the estimates of total catch for that species in particular. And then, of course, you know, for all species, um, commercial landings estimates are always changing slightly, but definitely not to the degree that the recreational estimates did with the new MRIP methodology. And so the recreational, your understanding of recreational fishery, both in catch and in 
or landings and in this cards has changed. But Correct. not so much on the commercial side. No, not not to the same degree. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. This gentleman back here. Uh, David Wright, I'm on a charter boat and commercial waterman. One of your first slides you said that the way I believe uh, a little farther down? A little further down. Uh, the, the way one? you are looking, our understanding of recreational and commercial landings and catch has changed. Mm -hmm. What's changed? You, you read it, but you didn't explain it. Uh, your understanding, yeah, I see that they were allocations for from the 80s. Early 90s, mm -hmm. but what has changed about your understanding of the landings? Yes, yeah, so um, MRIP uh, used to use a survey um, that was landline based. Um, and Data collecting. Yes. Okay. Yes. And that was their their way of collecting um, estimates of recreational fishing effort. So the number of trips that are taken okay. that, in that a year. Was for effort, but not data, not landings data. So then, then the catch rate component, so how many fish are caught per trip, yeah. that's based on the um, angler intercept surveys. Um, and when you combine those two, when you, you know, you, it's a little bit more complicated than just multiplying, but when you bring those two estimates together, you can get an idea for the total amount of landings for a certain species coastwide over a year by combining how many trips were conducted, and then per trip, What's you know the average amount of fish that are caught, um, how many are discarded, and so on. And so that methodology switched. That's what I was getting at. It seems like your methodology has changed. Right. Your understanding should be the same of the data you collected. Right. So they. And that's where your first allocations came from. Is that data? Right. So they back calibrated um, the the findings from you know 1981, 1982 and earlier before they switched to the new methodology um, because they found that the landline surveys were um, underestimating, like systemically underestimating sure. uh, fishing effort. Sure. Um, and so by, by, by being able to identify that bias, they were able to back calibrate the estimates of landings. And so that's why um, their understanding of what actually was being caught has changed since they've switched to this new methodology. You know, and that seems like it's more of a wreck side of it than a commercial side. Yeah, that's, that's fair. Because everybody and their brother goes fishing, but nobody tells anybody unless they catch them. Okay, re recreationally. Mm -hmm. But I, majority of mine is charter, and anything I used to do commercial, there was accountability with every single trip with that. So I think you're on the right track saying something about for hire mm -hmm. versus recreational, putting in a different category. Because I think it's I think it really ought to be that way. I'm not trying to tell you to change anything right now, but that's just uh, I think you're on the right track with that. If it mm -hmm. was me trying to do your job, that's the way I would go. I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but mm -hmm. I've done this since the early 70s. Gotcha. And the changes are just <laughs> a little tough sometimes. So um, great first question. We, uh, the second part was a comment, and I want to remind me of your name again. David Wright. David Wright, OK. Yeah, Rudy Inlet. Now, I, I like to take notes. We have the recording, so I can go back through. Sure, but sure. before we launch into comments, and if I there's any last. i throw that at you. Oh, no, no worries. I understand, you know. Yeah, they're right into it. I, yeah, yeah, I wasn't trying to. So did you have a question? Yeah, the Egyptian you first. Go ahead. You got one, right? Oh, I, I've got more than one. <laughs> well, let him go first. Then. Well, yeah. no, he'll probably ask. I'll say what I'm going to ask. No, so. You go ahead. All right, can you bring the, the slide? Joe Del Campo, commercial waterman. Thanks. Can you uh, bring the slide up with the sea bass on it, with the data? Uh, the graph? Yes. Okay, you said that the commercial data remain fairly constant. Over time, yeah. I mean, there's some fluctuations, as you can see. And is that due to the fact that we're on a head quota and not just go fishing whenever you want? 
that yeah that has a big how influence that on that. A big influence, um, mm -hmm. Why that any carb? Absolutely. Right? Now, how are you estimating the recreational cash exactly? Are you just taking dockside sir? I know you have the phone survey, and the email survey, but are you doing it state by state or up and down the whole East Coast? It's it's along the whole East Coast. And every uh, done evenly in each state. Um, I mean, prioritize certain areas. Bigger, bigger states have, have more samples than smaller states. Yeah, I mean, there's there's variability in, in the number of intercepts that that are used to et estimate the catch rate component. Um, for example, North Carolina has really worked hard to step up their intercepts in recent years, and they're particularly good at you know getting. Um, uh, they, they seem to have a lot of intercepts for bluefish, whereas other states are maybe a little bit more deficient in that. Um, but overall, they try to representatively sample all states um, so that we can get a good idea state by state what are, what are the landings for all the species. And what are your criteria for estimating discords? That's part of the discords. That's part of the same. So finding out how many releases there are. That's part of the same intercept uh, survey process. Um, but then you, you factor in a discard mortality percentage. That's, that's what I want to know about. How do you know what's dead and, and what's going to recover after you shovel it over a board or unhook it or whatever you're going to do with it? Mm -hmm. what, what, what formula are you using for that? That's a good question. Um, so there, in, in some cases, there are like empirical studies, um, tagging studies um, that look at this. And as you know, as a fisherman, you know it varies quite widely depending on temperature, where you are, how deep the fish was when you pulled it out. Um, but by doing those empirical studies in, in different habitats, different um, climates, as well as doing kind of like a meta analysis of you know what's the discard mortality rate for other species that are very similar, they can, to their best ability, uh, range in on a, a discard mortality percentage. And you. With full knowledge, knowing that that varies by location and situation, but overall, um, if you look at the big picture and you've got, you know, millions of fish being discarded, they feel they have a best available science kind of confidence in their discard mortality percentage. Okay, when you do your formula up here, are you factoring in the amount of recreational boats that have entered the fishery in the last 20 years, or are you just saying, well, we use this data and apply it back when there a totally different method of fishing. Um, the the amount of people entering the fishery should be um, caught by the fishing effort survey. It should be or will be. Both. Um, it's you know if you look back in time and you've got less people saying that they're fishing and you've got less responses in a survey and then you look forward in time and you're seeing those responses really tick up. That's in essence, capturing the increased fishing effort on a coastwide basis. Okay, and right now, you don't want comments, right? Just questions. Just, if you don't mind, okay. just so we can uh, get to all the questions. Appreciate Thank you. that. Okay, Jim, you're next. As far as comments, questions. No, James, questions. questions. Uh, James Dawson, commercial uh, hook and line and drop pot fisherman from Chincoteague, Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, when I was going through the Virginia MRIP data, it said that we had caught 1.85 million recreational fish, yet Virginia only reported 186,000 pounds caught, uh, which if you look at the average fish that's caught, should equal around 3 million pounds. Um, now I know how our 49.51% works, um, I'm just wondering how we can get a more exact science than what it is because the, um, rather than getting into comments, I'm, I'm just asking a question on that, uh, is to get better data. And I think that's why they, they kind of worked away from that this year because is, am, am I getting, uh, am I hitting close to what that's, what you guys are doing when you went status quo? It's because the AMRIP was, um, so I think those are two things, and I'll try to disentangle them. Um, in terms of those specific numbers, I'd, ha I'd have to sit down with you um, and really go over that to really suss out what you're, what you're getting at. But I will say that we have been provided with contact information from MRIP staff, 
and he's expressed willingness to engage with those kind of questions and and to his best ability increase transparency with their process. I know you're supposed to go with it, but you decided not to go with it. So right, I'm, and I'm that's just... the second part I'll get into. Yeah. So if you if you want to discuss those kind of things, the uh, Virginia's estimate, uh, I encourage you to take down his contact information. Uh, but in terms of the second part as to why we went status quo, uh, the board and the council found that with such significant changes in the MRIP estimates, um, they needed some time before doing draconian measures to really like clamp down on the fishery right then and there. So that's that's why we're here, really. Um, yeah, because I noticed that every percentage was taken away from the commercial fishery, uh, according to your chart. I don't know why you used 1983 to 92 when we're filling out uh, VTR reports. We're using safe, uh, safest. We're using bluefin data. You have a lot more information from a commercial standpoint. Um, the, the recreational fishermen have to charter party, like you're saying, sector reporting. They have to report. Um, there's data available. I don't feel as though you guys are using, I don't know why you're using such ancient data. Uh, the commercial limits, my point would be that we're all on a quota and if you, you, you have to really look at the IFQ programs like we have in Virginia where we're all dependent on it, um, you're, you're talking about a significant change again. Um, we want you to take that into consideration how diverse each fishery is, whether it's troll, whether it's drop pot, whether it's standard pot, hook and line. What is, we don't have dead discards. So I don't know how we can do something, but I think you should look at the, um, the diversity there and in, in, in how we're dependent, especially in this state, on you know, looking at perhaps better data than 83 to 92. That would be my, my... We're getting back into comments. Yeah, yeah. I know. yeah it's I, hard I'm to do. I mean, you, yeah. you start with a question, you get into comments. I think if we're if we're there for comments, if it, maybe we'll take any last question before. Any other I questions? questions? Let him go first. Um, yeah, go ahead. So could you go back to your list of possible uh, alternatives or possible ideas? Uh, this one? Yeah, so I, I'll just take your last one, your last bullet. Or I think there may be another one in there that could apply this. But I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. And yeah. I want to run by you the SCUP estimates for 2019, all right? And these are rough MRIP estimates. They may not, or they may be incomplete. Mm -hmm. Commercial estimates are not finalized yet, but these are the round numbers. Mm -hmm. So we had OFL 41 million pounds for SCUP 2019. The ABC was 36 million. Commercial cash was 13 million. The recreational estimates 13 million. Forget about all the other cash limits, RHLs, and everything else. Mm -hmm. If we're under the ABC, at the end of the year, if we're under the ABC, mm -hmm. and we uh, estimate discards, and we're under the ABC for both sides, and the stock is still increasing. We're doing what it, I mean, I don't even remember SCUP's 200% rebuilt. I, I can't recall the exact numbers. But what would be the harm in doing that exercise on paper each year and not getting hung up on percentages? Because commercial side is a percentage. It is an actual number. And in SCUP, as in the other two species, is an estimate. Mm -hmm. So even if they go over the RHL, and we go under our cash limit. In the end, if you're not going over the ABC, then what would it matter? Is that what you're thinking about? Is is that an option? In a sense, a continuation of, of what the board went with for, for 2020. Um, that last bullet is not, in effect, it's, it's, it's formalizing the process you just talked about. Yeah, exactly. So, the, like for bluefish, um, for for many years there was a, a, a sector oh, yeah. transfer yeah. 
from the recreational side to the commercial side um, if the recreational fishery was projected to underachieve the RHL. Um, and that was capped at 10.5 million pounds. Um, and I think for 10 years, um, not 2019, and, and certainly not for 2020, but for 10 years, there was a, a transfer that occurred. And that was only possible um, because it had been written into the fishery management plan. Um, so that's what the allocation transfer is potentially talking about, which in effect, you know, the end goal is and the result is still the same. You're not exceeding the ABC um, and you're, you know, increasing the livelihoods of the commercial fishermen. But this is maybe suggesting it could go both way. It could go either way. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an option. The second part of that bullet is a set aside. So essentially, that could look like something like a percentage of the allocation that's not allocated to either side, but it's kind of like a, a buffer. Um, so yeah, that's in essence, yeah. Great, thank you. Can you go back to your graph again that we had a little earlier to see that graph? Which one? The Black sea bass? bass. Oh, that hit right there, okay. Is it correct that the commercial data is taken from trip report? So an exact number? Um, Where do you get that data from? It is um, from safest trip reports. Um, so accurate. Hell, uh, see that sold through a federally permitted dealer, that number is reflective of that amount, correct? Yeah. It, I mean, they do get revised a little bit. Um, They're less than 1%. Yeah, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but yes, very small revisions. Okay, and now the recreational data is totally an estimate based on your dock side survey and your emailings and your phone calls. Yeah, so, so the, the fishing effort number. survey and the, the intercept surveys, right, yes. Right, so that could have, wild, have calculated estimate of effort and landings on the, on the recreational side. Yeah, so each of those estimates is accompanied by um, what they say is a PSE, so a percentage standard error. Okay. So they're, they're estimates, and there's like a confidence interval around all those estimates. And on a coast-wide basis, the PSEs are a lot smaller. They're more accurate. But again, there's you know a confidence interval. It's not a point estimate that you should say this is definitely exactly what the landings are. Is the, the PSE different for recreational versus commercial? Or so the same, the same number? The PSE values are only um, associated uh, with, at least from the MRIP side of things. I, I'm not aware of a PSE on the commercial right. side. So our, so the commercial number is a fairly hard number that you're fairly confident in. Mm -hmm. And the recreational number is something that, well, we think this is what it might be. Yeah. Okay. Now the the changes in MRIP were were designed to more accurately um, be able to estimate the total catch. So there was an improvement, at least from a statistic side of view. Um, but yes, there are PSEs associated, and it's there's some variability around those estimates, okay. especially when you zoom in on like a state or a year or sector like level. Also, when you're considering the recreational catch, are you taking into consideration that other species may have a closed season and that is forcing more people to fish for black sea dash because let's say flounder season is not closed or scup is closed or tall tog is closed, so now they're concentrating their effort on what's open? That should be picked up um, by the catch rate estimates. Um, you should see maybe an uptick but in a certain cause, species. Right? Not, it, it would be a cause of why the number is higher, not just because it's higher. Yeah, there isn't, um, the, the estimates aren't really uh, accompanied by like a causation. I mean, we all discuss this. The board members, the council members discuss what are the fishery trends. We, we talk with the advisory panels about what are the trends in the fishery. Um, so that kind of qualitative information is picked up um, through those channels, but not necessarily like an MRIP estimate. Right. Well, for many years, we did not have a closed season for many species. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, in the, in the last 10 years, we had closed seasons. And I think that that perhaps is pushing more people to fish for sea bass. And I'm just wondering if that's being considered at all when you're doing this. Um, 
when people are targeting CMS. Right, because every yeah. other things are closed. Yeah, and, that, and that's a fair comment. Um, I got a question. Well, mine, I thought mine was a question. We can turn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put your time. I'm done. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, go ahead. If you if you said you have a question, or should, are we ready for comments? Because I'll, I'll I'll just start taking down notes just in case. Um, I don't want to miss anything. So go ahead. All right. So it's kind of quick. I mean, that, I, I'm sorry that we kind of get it's, it's tough to not get into a comment. So I revised. No, I understand that. <laughs> a question based on what I'm seeing here and what he's talking about. I'm kind of meshing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Why is NOAA Fisheries asking us commercial fishermen and party charter sea bass fishermen to report uh, using a vessel trip report? And then you're using this data uh, when, from 1998 forward, it was when we started using vessel trip reports, and then we started getting into quotas that held the commercial fishermen back. Uh, I'm wondering why they're not using the data from 1998 forward and, uh, you know, why are we filling all these reports out if they're not utilizing it in what you're doing? No, that's a good question. Um, I'm glad you glad you brought that up. So they are using EVTR data um, when so basically they have the four hour survey. Um, it's a telephone survey um, that estimates fishing effort, and then you've got the EVTR data. And whenever you see a, a match, you know the same fisherman with both of those data points. They replace the four hire survey with the EVTR estimate. Um, and so for the fishing effort side, um, we are using EVTR data. But in terms of the catch rate um, estimates, um, because they've found, Emmer staff have found that it's been more robust, there's more entries for the four hire survey uh, side of things. Um, They've, they've found that they need to be using that one until we can fully transition to EVTRs and eventually, hopefully at some point, um, EVTRs will be relied upon for both sides, not only the fishing effort component, but also the catch rate component as well. Because my point was looking at your thing, it gets into a comment, but it, it's, we're being held back on our side where they're not, and that's why it's exploding. Um, so, on, you mean when you're looking at just um, recreational fishermen in general versus yeah, the four hour sector? Just going crazy on the, oh, oh, from side. commercial recreational. For the, from the recreational yeah. side, and that's what he was uh, commenting on. Yeah. For, for black sea bass. Oh, black sea bass, yeah. All right, I, I, unless anyone, I mean, feel free to jump in with a question, but what, we can go ahead with public comments at this point. Um, I've jotted down a few here, but. Um, I'm not the best with names and faces, so if you don't mind every time just saying your name, just so we got it in the record, as well as so it refreshes my memory. Greg. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, Greg D. Domenico, Garden State Seafood Association. Um, so first of all, um, we're looking for, uh, obviously we're here to protect our own interests from a, from a commercial perspective. Mm -hmm. But we have no desire to disadvantage the recreational sector or the fire, for hire sector in, in any way, shape, or form. So it really is up to the council and commission to develop a fair and equi equitable outcome on this amendment, specifically, excuse me, specifically given the history of what's gone on with the Mercer Fisheries. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important that people realize that the MRIP program was supposed to be updated, uh, mandated by Congress to be updated in 2009. It's 10 years too late. I don't know why it took so long. That's not for me to, uh, you know, ask. But, you know, when you look at the chart, you say to yourself, that's what happened over the last 10 years while we waited for MREP to be complete. And now that it's complete, I've been to five of these hearings. I haven't heard a single person say they believe the MRIP estimates. So, um, and the other part to this is, 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 is while people have been waiting, um, the four hire sector and the recre recreational sector have actually had more restrictive bag limits, seasons, and size in those 10 years. I can't imagine what the loss of 
um, opportunity and, uh, and, and, and money and discards that have been somewhat uh, wasted in those 10 years. People really are looking back and saying, I cannot believe we've been waiting for this for 10 years, and here's where we are. Now, the other part is, is that I think to avoid more restrictive recreational regs, which should be everybody's goal, the council and the commission either has to initiate a framework or an addendum to get something done to, 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 um, to create an administrative process that, quite frankly, they've already been doing as demonstrated by those graphs. Um, I think that if there are overages of ABCs or OFLs from 2019 or in 2020, um, the, the regulations are going to become re more restrictive. And I don't think anybody wants that to happen, certainly not our organization or, or me for that matter. And then lastly, I would say that um, the, the, the likelihood of well, I shouldn't say likely, but I, I'd like to say that everybody, almost everybody that has been to these meetings, uh, maybe there's a few that I've missed, a few comments that I've missed, but, but a lot of people want a fair and equitable, equitable outcome. And that's pretty refreshing having been doing this for a long time. And so, again, it's going to be incumbent on the council and the commission to come up with something that doesn't penalize any group, because I can't imagine taking, a, taking first of all, can't imagine how much you'd have to take from the commercial side to actually get a change in bag size in the season. And I can't imagine there be any justification for taking uh, 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 that much from the commercial sector, given the history of these fisheries. So um, that's my comment. I'll, I'll be making written comments, I think, and, and certainly be on the webinar. But um, for, our, uh, for our association, um, those are the important issues. Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh, and I'm sorry also. Could you go to your bullets for the questions, just so we get those correctly on the record? Your four bullets. Uh, for the oh, here? Sure. Yeah. So obviously, from our perspective, uh, again, Garden State Seafood Association, we'd like to see the sector allocation stay the same. Uh, I'm not really sure what the third bullet is. But then the last bullet is, uh, I'd like to reiterate that um, council and commission should begin a framework or some other addendum to avoid recreational, more restrictive recreational regulations uh, in the near future. And I think the commission and the council should also figure out a program for mandatory reporting of um, tournaments, recreational tournaments. Thank you. Thanks. Let's get once. Yes, sir. I think you had the answer. Harry Doherty, commercial hook and line fisherman from Cocosin. Put that. Uh, by your second chart, the uh, 4951 uh, percentage. That one now, the 4555, if I understand it, that's the landings for that time period of 80 something to 90 something. Um, you're looking at the bottom right on the right. green side? Yeah, so. <laughs> That, that percentage breakdown is if you use the same base years, so you're correct, 83 to 1992, that were used in the original fishery management plan and just plug in uh, their updated understanding of the data, and you would see that as the allocation between the two commercial and recreational fisheries moving forward. So 45% to the commercial and 55% to the recreational. What's the value of those percentages? In other words, What's people looking at them for? Why, why are we considering those? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's been alluded to by Greg that um, you know a small percentage change like 51% to 55% in terms of what the recreational fishery is allowed to catch wouldn't do too much in the way of uh, preventing overly restrictive recreational measures. Um, but when you look at another species such as scup jumping from 22% to 35%, that may be the difference between, you know, a, a 15 fish bag limit and a five fish bag limit. Now I'm just I'm just pulling those numbers out of thin air just to make a point that 
when you see a greater allocation, a higher percentage to the recreational fishery, that is often met as uh, with uh, less restrictive management measures such as bag limits and uh, smaller seasons and stuff like that. So that's, that's why these percentages are important because depending on how much each fishery is allocated, it affects the commercial guys in terms of what they're allowed to bring home and catch, and it affects the recreational guys in terms of what their management measures look like. Because we're required uh, by Magnuson to prevent overfishing, and on the recreational side, we do that through uh, recreational measures, and on the commercial side, um, there's other processes, but essentially it comes out to being a quota. <clears throat> I, I hope that helps. Okay, well, the recreational wasn't allocated that much. How much are they over their limit? Where is that brought into play? You mean in recent years? Huh? You mean in recent years, how, how far over the 51% yeah. were they? Right. Um, yeah, this graph will hopefully... If, if they, for their annual quota, if that number would be considered, you would probably be right at your 49, 51, or maybe even less. Yeah, so. The, the, record, the commercial were held one year. The commercial went over a little bit. And the recreational went over almost every year. No wonder they're catching more than the commercial, because they do what they want. They're, there's no enforcement, period. Hey, so it sounds like to you so there's... You better get another column up there and tell, tell what, it, what their allocation is if you're going to use it for anything. Right, so it sounds like a catch accountability is really... Recreational accountability is really important to you. Um, and, and to the point you were bringing up, if you look at the, the white line, that's the recreational harvest limit. Um, and then you can look at the solid blue line in the bottom graph, and that's what was actually being caught. And they were so high over that um, because our understanding of their catch um, changed in recent years. So while we had been thinking we were restricting to them to the recreational harvest limit, the actual, based on our new understanding, our actual landings were much higher. So um, I'm taking out of that that recreational accounting uh, recreational catch accounting is, is accountability is really important and I, I guess I would flip the question back to you and see if any of you in the room have any ideas on on what that means what does recreational accountability mean to you I'm ready go ahead uh, Joe Del Campo commercial waterman so the way I'm seeing this the recreational sector goes way over many years in a row and your answer to fix that problem is not, we're going to crack down and make sure they stay within their limit. Your answer is, let's give them more fish. How on earth does that make sense to anyone in this room or you? The answer to, to the problem is, let's give them some fish from the guys who are on a quota. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, that's not a suggestion I'm making okay. at all. Um, I'm, I'm here putting forward potential ideas. So uh, yeah, just to clear it up. Well, write that when down, I, it's ridiculous. Okay, <laughs> just want to clarify that putting forward those percentages by no means like a standpoint that I'm making. It's simply the data. I understand. Yeah, yeah. That, they're going way over their quota instead of saying, well, maybe we need to restrict them to five fish or, or eight fish a trip. The team answer is going to be, hey, give them more quota, and then they, maybe they won't go over it. That makes no sense at all. Go ahead, Mark. I hear you. <laughs> Yeah, um, my, my thought, uh, Mark Hodges, I'm a commercial um, sea bass fisherman in Virginia Beach. Um, do you have this table four, page 13? Sorry, my memory is failing me. What is that one again? Table four it shows the landings. Oh, yeah, I can thing? pull that up. Okay. Yeah, that's for black sea bass. This one, correct? Right, so we started out with those base years. Now, M, the new MREP, we want to go back and readjust all the recreational catches. Well, if you look at 1986, that 12.39 million has got to be a, a 
some kind of false anomaly. I mean, there's no way in the world they can go from 2 million to 12 back to 2 again. Something's wrong in the picture. There's not that many more sea bass or that many more people fishing for them back in 1986. So if you lower that down to 2 or 3 million, commercial would be ahead of the recreational percentage change. I mean, okay, it's not in the graph. Allocated every year. Yeah, I was I was hoping that I could see that in the graph, but I forgot that we yeah, cut it off at 1989. Yeah. You know, y'all did all this recreational study, and I know, and and over here on the the current data, none of the commercial change. Well, back in from 83 to 92, there was a lot of fish sold for cash. None of that was accounted for. None of it. And if any, if half of that had been accounted for, commercial would be at probably 60, 40. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. But it was it was rampant and it was happening. Um, let me see. You know, another thing that, it, I'm like Joe, this is a recreational grab. They have the numbers, they have the people, they have the push, they have the politics behind the state representatives. That's where all this is coming about. Um, and you know they they may come up with a victory by just having the number of votes um, but if we go through a plan change are we going to have accountability in that plan change are they going to have closures is that going to be in the plan it's ridiculous that it's not in the plan now or they wouldn't have been going over for uh, the past whatever about 20 years right so right the the and last question yeah, so to answer your question, um, there was an omnibus amendment, I'm forgetting the year at this point, but um, it was put in place so that uh, a pound for pound payback, which I think is what you're referring to, you know, if you have an overage, um, would well, not need to. Sector. Right, it occurs in the recreational sector, but only when um, the fishery is overfished or overfishing is occurring. Right. Um, and the omnibus amendment came in and, and kind of changed the rules saying, a little. That you saying that's not going to be part of the new plan? That can no, certainly be in the plan if, um, and, and you being concerned about that, I'm taking notes, and it's going to be in the public comment, um, and it's, it's definitely something that could be considered as something that needs to be written into the plan. Right, because I don't get, I mean, I'm not a recreational fisherman, uh, you know, I don't want a party boat or anything, but it would be my interest that I wouldn't want any closures because the way that it seems no matter what you change, they're still going to go over be just because of the sheer numbers. So they're going to have half a year is going to be closed or the last three or four months can be closed every single year. So that's something that they all look at before they really push this graph, which that's exactly what it is. Um, and, you know, one way I think just as a comment, um, how to solve um, the discards. I don't know what the percentage of discards that's up there is considered dead or alive. I know the commercial discards is like 10% is considered dead. But the, some of the discards on your other graph, it's almost what it, the commercial catches in a year. So mm -hmm. could they change it to maybe change the limit to like 11 inches and they have to keep the fish? They, if they catch a fish over 11 inches, they have to keep that fish until they get to the 5 or 10 or 15 or whatever. In other words, lawfully they can't high grade. I know it would be almost impossible to enforce, but at least it'd be, it'd be fairly enforceable on party boats. Um, that's jotting down your, your comments okay. there. That's definitely something that could be considered. Um, like you said, there has always been some management measures that are a little bit harder to enforce. Um, but it's definitely something that, that can be considered if that's um, a potential solution for reducing discards. And I think everyone recognizing, recognizes that discards are, are an issue, and it, it is frustrating to have to throw back fish. Um, so, you know, any ideas around how we can reduce that that's, are very because, valuable. Because the discards are so high, the commercial sector gets penalized because of that. We reduce quota every other year. So the recreational for it to not be rewarded with more quota because they go over every year. That's not how you're going to solve the that. problem. So I'm, I'm a status quo. Thank you. 
This gentleman in the back. Yeah, David Wright, uh, Charter Commercial, Fish to Pay Bills. Uh, what Mark was just saying, totally agree with, should not be a closure for the commercial end. It should be an allocation and let them fish till they get it uh, for the commercial. Now, the recreational, I do both, okay, so it's not really even a biased thing, but I think fair. Something I believe Joe's hit on earlier. Now, we have closed tile fishing but open sea bass fishing. Open sea bass fishing but closed tile fishing. And there's some boats here that aren't even, the people that aren't even represented here that take the majority of people out there. Of the closed season to be looked at. If you're gonna close it, I think you should close them both at the same time and let them both be open at this time. At the same time, blue line tile fish, which I know it's not on the agenda here, but it is for a VMRC Virginia thing mm -hmm. that the black sea bass could be closed and then opened at the same time as that other fish. This is in regard to what Joe was hitting on earlier with sort of paying attention to the effort that will be put towards the sea bass if you close the tile fish. We can't go in this area where we'll get them both. So, you know, these numbers change because of that. And if you have them open across the board and closed across the board at the same time, it's cost some of the boats in Rudy Island quite a bit of money for closures at different times. That's it. Appreciate it. Go ahead. James Dawson, commercial hook and line and drop pot fisherman, Shank Cape, Virginia. Um, when I was reviewing uh, the, the options on the recreational side, um, I felt as though, you know, we, we have a lot of people that we all know that uh, are friends and they fish alongside of us. And just like he's sitting there saying, when one's closed and one's open, you know, if you're reducing numbers, it helps if they can catch another fish mm -hmm. at the same time. They're going to catch them anyway, and if they're in deep water, they're, they're you know, not going to survive. So that would help. But the recreational options that I was looking at, and, the, and like you said, at the severity of it, I think that I'd like you guys to understand that they make a, and they depend on that Memorial Day to Labor Day time frame. It's, it's very serious. Um, so I'd like to keep that in mind. And on the commercial side, uh, you know, we depend on uh, something much different in each state. Um, we feel as though here in Virginia we do the best job and we have the best numbers because we have an individual quota. Um, and the, the fisheries are totally different and they don't have dead discards. I mean, if you look at the observer data, for me, I don't have dead discards. Everything is released alive and that is noted in their notes. Um, but in stating that, I mean, we should be looking at perhaps a starting point like the original poundage. I believe our state has touched on that. That could really help our, our families which depend on it and maybe work from something on that where you're looking at what you've already given for 20 years so that it doesn't impact us that severely, you know, from the commercial sector. On the accountability, our state has been threatened a month early when we here in Virginia had not even started to catch in December. They kept calling Joe Semino saying, when, you know, we're going to have to shut down, we're going to have to shut down. And he was saying, hey, listen, we, we have people that did not do anything wrong. We did not catch our quota. And it's like rewarding those who go over if, if you do this. And that's on both sides. If, if you're rewarding the recreational side for going over every year, by giving them more, what is that saying? I mean, they keep getting rewarded for a lot of people that are, are underreported. And like you're saying, you're, you're even alluding to the fact that you're meshing an e-file with you know, the actuality. I'm looking into that myself. When I know who's fishing, I know what they caught, and then I know what they report. There's a lot of that that goes on. So I just wanna make sure we have that accountability measure in the next plan when we change a plan. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Not hearing any. 
Now's the time if you have any last ideas. Yeah, go ahead. Mark Hodges again. Kind of on Jim's point, um, there's on the accountability, um, you know, you've got so many private boats that don't go through a marina. You know, the people live on the water, they fish, they catch sea bass, they go home, nobody ever knows about it. Um, I know it would be you know, burdensome for them to have to you know, do paperwork like we have to do, um, but there's got to be some kind of system that is better accounted, you know, accountability on what, they, what they're actually catching. Um, I know up north, New York and, and those states, there's a whole lot more nooks and crannies where people come out to go fishing versus down here in Virginia. And I'm sure the same thing goes on. They fish in closed seasons down here. Um, the, you know, you know those fish aren't reported. And so that's one of the, the biggest things. You know, I don't want to pick on the recreational side, but you know, if you want to solve the problem, that's 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 part of the, the problem is not having a grasp of what's actually being caught um, in the recreational fishery. So you know, some better type of reporting or you know, some yeah, accountability. You know, accountability on how many people are actually doing it, and you know, and, and they're that smart enough to realize September first. We're, we're open in, in February, and, and they're smart enough to realize that if people fish that time of month, they're going to get shut down. So a lot of them don't report. So you know, they've got, <coughs> they've got the system figured out. So it, yes, a lot more accountability if that could be, um, you know, some form. Put up. Thank you. Appreciate it. I do want to be cognizant of uh, the I'll time, but we got maybe a few more. Uh, can you put the chart up again of actual catch versus the allocation? Uh, the well, I'll see if I'm thinking of the same thing. Um, were you thinking this graph? Yes. Okay. So from what I see, that the recreational sector shot over almost double or triple their allocation. And there's no payback. There's no shutdown season for them. There's no payback. You guys seem to think the answer is to give them more fish, but there's no penalty for them. It makes no sense. I, I'm in favor of status quo. All right, thanks. Oh, uh, this gentleman hasn't spoken yet. If you wouldn't mind giving your name and. Oh, my name is Tom Powers. I'm a worker. Oh, God. I like you. Um, one question about this data, were the recreational fishermen fishing on the old tech methods versus the new methods, or the new MRIC versus MRFIS? When did that change? So, um, Because if, for example, to say, uh, I think it was like 2015, 2016, so up until that point, the recreational fishermen might have been going over a little bit, but they weren't going over ridiculous, like like it appears now. Mm -hmm. And I, I have very little trust in MRIP because they think that we have 850,000 recreational fishermen in Virginia when the a more accurate number is like 250. And that's based on the fisherman identification program, the license sales, which everybody who's between 16 and 65 is supposed to be in that with an allowance for people over 65 and under 16. So Everett still is not right. And their mail-in survey does not capture people who don't catch any or hardly fish at all. And yeah, to your point, um the recreational fishery was being monitored based on the landings that you see in the blue shaded boxes. Um, so for many of those years, um, it was under the RHL or, or just slightly over and not to the degree that, that we're seeing now based on the new MRIP information. Which, I, I don't know how you expand the fishery in Virginia at least, where the only people who are catching these are the guys that are going offshore, which is a small fraction of the fishery of the recreational fishing. Well, this particular graph is coastwide. I know, but... Yeah. David? Go ahead, David. David, right again. Just one thing for pertaining to the Black Sea bass in favor of status quo. That's it. 
Chip. Just, just one quick thing about what Mark had said. Uh, Dustin, can James Dawson from Shinkatee, Virginia. Appreciate it. Uh, can you look at the 1986 anomaly a lot more and then perhaps let's look at just keeping things status quo because that would really, if it would bring back that to basically the 49, 51% or something to that. And then, like I say, to work with the recreational, the status quo, and even Memorial Day to, to Labor Day, if you consider that, w without this uh, MRIP, I'm not, you know, it is a huge difference. Uh, something, you know, I know the Magnuson Act requires you to do something, but I'm just trying to think of everything all the way around. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, let's tie it up. We have a bluefish meeting after this, so you're more than welcome to stay. Like, um, it looks like we had one, yeah. Your yeah. mind, Robert Hollowell, I want to go on the status quo. Thanks, Robert. Eric, John, do the same thing. Yeah. Anything else? It's been a This is all the black sea bass. It's all about the um, can you put back up the, the contact information? Yes. The public comment ends the 17th. And I would like you to can either basically do it, you know, you all give public board comment board. if you want to give written comment, yeah. you can do it no there. You can go to yeah. um, the, the council board board website or the council's board website board. and get the addresses if you need to. And uh, provide, that if, you know, provide any written yeah. comment yeah. you want to. Will the, written co will the oral comment today be put into the record? Or do we yeah, they will be, yeah. Follow up with yeah. a written comment, or will have any additional? No, we'll be in the written comment that they'll fill the So there's no need to write a letter if we're here. Right, you, if you want to, you can, but you don't have to. Okay. If you, you know, come up with additional ideas or things you want to talk about that you forgot to today, that's, that's the place for an additional written comment. Okay.